So welcome everyone. My name is Bill Hirsch. I'm the director of the AIDS Legal Referral Panel and I wanna thank MOFO for generously hosting this event for us. And I wanna thank um, our wonderful board members and staff who are here uh, for this event. And I am really thrilled to see the great turnout this evening. I'm really excited to celebrate 40 years of ALRP um, and share some of the stories around how ALRP got started. So um, I, I forgot to mention that Bailiff is our co-sponsor for this evening and uh, we'll hear more about Bailiff in a, a bit. Four decades ago, back when I was a young gay man, I moved to San Francisco to attend law school. It was the same year ALRP was founded. 1983 was a dark and scary time in San Francisco. AIDS was a deadly disease that was not well understood. There was no treatment, much less a cure. People living with AIDS were subject to the very worst kinds of discrimination, losing their jobs, their housing, their loved ones. At a time when there was absolutely no government support, an array of San Franciscans and local organizations sprang up to address the needs of people living with AIDS. ALRP was one of those organizations, a group of volunteer attorneys coming together, eager to share their time and expertise with those who needed it most. Tonight, our esteemed panelists will share some of their rich origin story of the AIDS Legal Referral Panel, they were critical to our founding and are still actively supporting our organization. It is a rare and precious gift to hear from them as we commemorate this landmark of four decades of community service. Of course, the story of AIDS in San Francisco is much larger than one person or even one organization. It is the story of a community coming together to support the most marginalized members among us, LGBT folks, immigrants, people of color. It is the story of a grandmother named Ruth Brinker delivering meals to people who could not get out of bed as much as it is the story of volunteer attorneys fighting against an almost limitless list of terrible wrongs, evictions, terminations of employment, denials of benefits. I always say that the folks who are least able to navigate the system are the folks who are forced to deal with it the most. Believe me, when you get that eviction notice in the mail, you want a good attorney. Everyone here tonight has been touched by the AIDS crisis. There are many here tonight who are living with HIV, just as there are many who are not here with us tonight. ALRP's highest leadership award is named for ALRP's first executive director, Clint Hockenberry, who died of AIDS. Just last year, ALRP lost another longtime supporter, Alice Philipson. There is no better way I can think of to honor their memories than to recommit to the fight of ensuring that everyone living with HIV has access to healthcare, housing, and basic human rights. There are still 16,000 folks living with HIV in San Francisco, and they still need legal representation. The people of San Francisco have always modeled a response to a public health crisis with compassion and science. While we have made great strides in treatment and prevention, our great city is still suffering and is hard to witness. But we must always remember what a group of dedicated individuals can do. Like our esteemed panelists, anyone can make a huge difference, not only in the life of an individual, but for an entire community. I would like to invite Bailiff Board Co-Chair Dustin Helmer to say a few words before we introduce our panelists and our moderators. Dustin is a deeply committed public interest attorney representing the best of LRP and Bailiff. Dustin. Get out my mic, sir. I don't, I don't need a mic. I'm loud. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Bill, for those kind words. I did not pay Bill to say that. So um, I'm really privileged and honored to be here. Uh, I was a staff attorney at the AIDS Legal Referral Panel 
uh, from 2016 to 2019 and a law clerk from 2013 until uh, I basically bullied Bill into hiring me. Uh, before coming to ALRP, I admittedly didn't really know much about uh, HIV or AIDS. I hadn't really had a connection to any sort of gay community. I had like only gay in the village syndrome when I was in law school. I was the token gay and it was just sort of like, oh, okay, I like, I don't know where I can build my community. Uh, and I found that by working with individuals uh, at ALRP. And it wasn't until then uh, when I was in law school that I also joined Bailiff and afterwards that I realized the connection. Um, for those of you who don't know, Bailiff was founded in uh, 1980 as a means to get uh, LGBTQ individuals onto the judiciary. And in 1983, ALRP uh, was sort of the offshoot of that. And obviously our panelists will be discussing that. So spoiler alert. Um, <laughs> sorry, I don't mean, yeah, I don't mean to steal your thunder. Uh, so because of basically the huge success of ALRP, it sort of became like its own entity and has grown into the really well-established and well-respected nonprofit that, again, I had the privilege of uh, working with today. And just, um, just to just so the audiences like can see, like who here is either a current staff member or former staff member of ALRP? So uh, yeah, I mean, these are the people who are on the front lines working with some of the most vulnerable individuals in the city. Um, and I encourage any, anybody who is interested in being involved with learning about the HIV and AIDS epidemic from long-term survivors, working with uh, individuals who need legal assistance if you have the time or the money, uh, please donate because we like both of those, but probably money, right? We love that. So, you know, we, we got bills to pay. So um, as one of the co-chairs of Bailiff, uh, one of the things that we wanted to do in honoring of the 40th anniversary of ALRP is to provide every staff person uh, at ALRP with a free member Bailiff membership in honor of sort of recognizing our inextricable link. You're all welcome. You can any later. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, again, you know, Bayless and ALRP were really created at the same time. And again, it's really great that we are here hearing from people who have gone through it, especially at the beginning of Pride Month and considering all the, you know, shit that's going on in our world right now. So, you know, I'm really excited to hear from our panelists and uh, yeah, cool. Thank you. Thanks, Justin. So let me introduce our, our panelists. We have Mark Senek, one of the founding members of ALRP. Mark recently retired from his practice, which focused on estate planning. Next, we have Fred Hurt, one of the founding members of ALRP. Fred has served the community in many roles and has had a longtime practice where he provides legal and mediation services in family law matters. Carl Wolf, one of the founding members of ALRP. Carl worked for many years as a partner in the law firm Callaway and Wolf. And now I will introduce our moderators. We have Sean Matlou. Uh, Sean is an ALRP panel attorney and for, former ALRP attorney of the year. And he practices immigration law. And then, then we have Cassandra Frias. Cassandra is a current board member um, and has served on ALRP's panel taking uh, immigration matters uh, for ALRP clients and is currently working at SafeArp. Um, I am proud to be a San Franciscan with real San Francisco values. These folks up here true are true San Francisco heroes. Let's show these folks some appreciation. So we'll have the moderators ask some questions. We'll go back and forth. Um, we'll ha hopefully have some time to take questions from the audience. There's plenty of food, there's still beverages. So hopefully we'll have time to hang out a little bit at the end, let the sparks fly. <laughs> 
Hi. Um, can you tell us how, um, how you helped to start ALRP? Uh, you know, this is like asking, you know, old married couples, you know, what was your first date? Or one person says, oh, it was in June. The other says, no, it's September. Um, so, and, and, and we're all getting kind of old. So uh, be patient here. No. Um, only some of us are getting old. Okay. Um, in the summer of 1982, Bailiff was two years old. And one of the things Bailiff did then was had these dinners where uh, prominent members of the community would come and talk and you could socialize. And there was a dinner at a restaurant somewhere, North Beach, Marina. Now you're remembering. Now I'm remembering, <laughs> yes. I was at that dinner. Large, large space. And the speaker was, we, and I have to say, you know, we didn't have Google back then. We re relied on our memories. Um, but I did Google it, and it was Sheldon Andelson, who was the first openly gay board, uh, member of the Board of Regents, appointed by um, Jerry Brown. And it was a very controversial appointment to have an openly gay member. He was a lawyer from Los Angeles, and he came and spoke. And I turned to Steve Richter, key person who died many years ago, and I said, oh, you know, these guys are dying. Um, we should organize some volunteers to write wills for them. That was, and, and the, key th the key thing about it, and Steve at that point, I think was or was about to be co-chair of bailiff with Robert Actenberg, and I was active in bailiff. So this was, it was a bailiff dinner, it was a bailiff event. So it all happened in that context. The key was we're writing wills. I mean, the only legal needs that people had at that point was wills because they were all going to die within months of a diagnosis. You didn't need long-term insurance. You didn't need other things. What you needed was a will, mostly. Um, and we were looking for volunteer lawyers. There was no thought about hiring people. I mean, it was like, where would there be money? So um, that was the first conversation that I had that then percolated over the next couple of months. And Mark, take it from there. So the, my first memory, and I was not part of this conversation. I didn't know it, it even happened until half an hour ago. But <laughs> back, back in 1983, late 82, early 83, Bailiff would sometimes have membership meetings, which it doesn't really do anymore. And at one of the membership meetings, Steve Richter got up and said, you know, we have people in our community who are dying from this disease. And what can we do to help? We can help them with wills. As Fred said, that was really the need at the time. And who here in the room would like to help get this off the ground? And so I put my name on a list or I don't know how, how it happened. And a meeting was then convened in Steve Richter's office and Fred was there, and of course, Steve Richter. And there was some guy from Marin County who I'd never heard of before and never saw again. So he gets some credit, whoever he is. <laughs> and, and I think Roberta Actenberg was there, but we're not sure. She was not there. <laughs> and <laughs> and um, so we talked about how will we do this? And it was decided, we went back and forth, different ideas, and it was decided that Steve would keep, we would solicit bailiff attorneys to be volunteers to do the wills. Steve would keep a list of them in his desk drawer. And then people from this group, and I know Fred did it and I did it and Steve did it. We went to various um, AIDS organizations and gay organizations and we told them of the availability of the service and um, gave Steve's office phone number. And the plan was that when somebody, so a client would call, Steve would take two names from the list in order, give those phone numbers out to the client. And that's the end of the story. If the client couldn't get a, con a connection with an attorney, the client could call back. And that is really how the AIDS legal, legal Referral Panel started. And by the way, it's legal referral, 
not legal services, because we were referring people to lawyers. We were not providing legal services at that point. Right. Well, I'll go back a couple of years before this 1983 meeting. I was on the original bailiff board. Well, I really, after a few months, uh, I took uh, Tom Steele's place. He was on the original board and he has since uh, passed. So this was, you know, 1981, uh, maybe early 81. And the first people- oh, you want to put your mic on? It's okay, on. it's on. It's on. Uh, it's on. And the, the first people that were <clears throat> dying of AIDS it started really in 1980 before there was even a name for the disease. It was like, oh, you know, somebody was well and then two weeks later they were gone and they had uh, some strange blood disease is how it started, right? Back in, in the, and so then by 81 and 82, there was still no name for it. First it was gay cancer and then it was GRID, you know, gay related immune deficiency. There was no test. You didn't know if you were infected or not until you all of a sudden got sick and those people that were getting sick started dying really fast uh, in their late teens, 20s, 30 year olds. So on the bailiff board before these meetings to uh, begin uh, planning for the actual AIDS legal referral panel, we saw this need. And so the board members you know, got together and said, who can volunteer to, and like Fred said, all people needed back then was wills and powers of attorney, you know, and they had to be done fast. Um, and so we had a list, we, we called our other bailiff members and, and uh, that's kind of was the seeds of the need and the response for, uh, for the very beginning of, of the uh, panel. But it wasn't even a panel. It was just it ended up being a, a committee of, of bail initially before these meetings. And so I just wanted to add, as Fred said, like a married couple who doesn't know when their first date was. When I had this, when we were in this meeting with Steve Richter, I knew nothing about what Carl's talking about. So ALRP has kind of several origin stories, I would say, and they just kind of merged at some point. Well, thank you for that historical background. Uh, as Carl just mentioned, we know that the AIDS crisis hit San Francisco hard. It was a very personal experience, whether you acquired the virus or not. What was your first experience dealing with AIDS? So I went, I went to work with a gay law firm in 1981. Um, the senior partner there was someone maybe some of you would, would have heard of Rick Stokes, who died about a year ago, got written up in The Advocate, which was very nice. Um, and he had a client who was dying. And so I remember it was like, it was late 1981, early 1982. He said, we need to go to the hospital. I need somebody else to be a witness on his will. And that was, I remember the person's name to this day, remember what his job was. He was a city planner in the city of San Francisco and um, went, he, he was at Kaiser Hospital and it was just a very scary experience. And it wasn't scary to me personally, I don't remember it that way, but you know, the kind of precautions that you had to take just to go into the room and the notices that were on the doors and the special staff that was allocated to each of these people. Um, and you know, we got the will signed. He knew, he knew, he obviously was competent to sign his will. Um, but I still remember, I, I, I just feel it in my veins that he had fear in his eyes and he died about a week later. Yeah. Um, well, in, in August of uh, 1983, um, myself and uh, Vivian Hamill started the law offices of Hamill and Wolf. And it happened to be the first gay man and lesbian law firm. There were lesbian law firms and gay men law firms, but Viv and I started this law firm. And of course, you know, people were already uh, dying. And my memory of, uh, of, of the first case that we had together was this 19 year old kid who came in with his uh, older older lover is what we referred to people back then as your lover, his partner. Um, 
and came into the office uh, at 414 Goff. And um, he was sick and 19, like I said. And uh, so we got all this information. And by the time, it, it just in a matter of a few days, uh, he was already hospitalized at Ward 5A in, at San Francisco General. And so Viv and I uh, had the will and the power of attorney prepared. And uh, we went to the hospital. And like Mark said, it was all these protocols. But it was so gut-wrenching, you know, uh, to be there and have the witnesses and sign this young kids will that when we we left uh we were just emotionally distraught we couldn't even go back to work you know and it, it was uh, uh just the beginning of, of a long a long many years of that was the situation because uh uh, protease inhibitors didn't start really getting released until 1986. Uh, I mean, 1996. So from 19, you know, early 80s until 1996, there was um, no no drugs that really worked very well. They had a lot of things. And I'll say one more story about about this young man, because um, he he died like uh, a few days later. Right. And his partner came to me and his body was taken to Sullivan's, you know, no longer there on Market Street next to Beck's. And uh, of course, his partner was listed as his power of attorney, but the funeral director was not going to give him the body. He said, I'm giving it to the parents in the East Bay. And it's like, oh, my God, you know, this is what was happening in the beginning. And so we had to, like, go full speed ahead with, uh, you know, phone calls and, and threats and uh, just to have his body go where he wanted to go and have his funeral what he wanted to be, you know. And, of course, we won. I mean, you know, we, we were able to do it. And, uh, and I just uh, remember that he said that uh, he wanted uh, In My Life by the Beatles to be played at his memorial, which was. So those were the kind of things that uh, we were doing in the beginning. You know, I wanted, I wanted to mention something that sort of builds on what Colin Mark said. You know, one of the things that was actually helpful, and we'll talk about this as we go forward, is I had a task. You know, I'm not a priest, I'm not a doctor, I'm not going to save anybody's soul. I'm not going to save anybody's body. I'm going to help them like decide who gets to run their funeral, right? These people didn't have a lot of possessions. You say wills. This is not like people had property or estates. It was as much about decision-making and autonomy and furniture and things like that. Um, now I'm going to get emotional. Um, I'll talk about some of the cases I had later, but what I want to say is one of my first experiences of this, when I was balancing that sense of, on the one hand, I got a job to do. On the other hand, it's as horrible as they describe. I told a friend of mine that I was going to do this particularly difficult case. I'll tell you about later. And I came home and she was sitting on my doorstep. My partner was away at the time and she said, you shouldn't be alone after you've just done what you did. And that was the kind of support that there was that she just totally on her own said, you shouldn't be having dinner alone when you came home. She didn't know when I was going to get there. She was sitting on my doorstep. And that was the kind of support we got as we dealt with people with AIDS. We all have stories about how friends of ours helped us. And, and yeah, it's hard to convey. I mean, you know, COVID maybe a little bit, but not really. It's hard to convey how scary this was. There was no even testing for HIV until 1985. And no clear sense of what the roots of contagion were. So there was a level of fear 
about it and the rapidity from diagnosis to death. It, it's just, it's, and, and, and also we were not like 70 year olds with social work degrees. You know, we were, you know, I was, you know, uh, 30 years old. We were we, 32 years old. We were young people at the time. So it was particularly challenging. Thank you for that. Um, so Carl and Mark have already touched on this, but Fred, can you tell us about your first ALRP client? Well, I don't know if it's the first or the second, but again, I'm going to start crying, I think. Um, there's a guy who was Black from the South. He was in the VA hospital. He had, what was that? Brain disease, bird toxoplasmosis. And one of the issues was like, is this guy competent to make decisions? It's like, not only are people going to die within a couple of weeks, they're going to move towards incompetence really soon. And also, I should say, you didn't have to be an estate planning lawyer to join the panel. People like Mark did trainings for us and helped us because I was not, I was a real estate lawyer. I was not a, um, and that's important to see because you could jump in and help. But, you know, it's like, I remember Virginia Palmer gave us a, a talk about competency and I'm thinking, you know, I guess I got to better get there this afternoon. Um, and I got there and we we're just talking about his lover was there and who's going to make the decisions and who's going to have the apartment and all that. And then I said, well, do you have family? And he said, I'm never, he said, I have seven brothers and sisters. I said, well, where are they? And I said, I'm not going to let them in this hospital because they're going to try to take over and kick my partner out. And I said, well, I, the one thing I can do is protect you from that. And he did a wills and power of attorney. And I went back. I don't know what there was, some follow-up document, because he'd already signed it. And there in the hospital room were all seven of his brothers and sisters. And he said, one, and I remember his, he was at this point almost dead, but his partner said, once we signed the papers for you, I no longer was afraid to invite them to the hospital. And I thought, you know, whatever I did in law school, whatever I've done since, I made that possible. And it's like, wow. You know, and, and, and let me just say that when you talk about, you know, we helped all those clients. You know, my therapy for dealing with AIDS, my, you know, in general in life, if I can't, I don't want to worry about a problem. I want to do something about it. I can't cure these people. I can't rescue these people. I can't house these people. But I enabled his brother and sister to come. And I thought, I'm doing something. And that was so therapeutic for me in terms of feeling like I was accomplishing something at this dark time. Yeah. And so the story I told about the visit to Kaiser Hospital it was not my first ALRP patient, uh, client because that was before there was an ALRP. And I don't, not to sound altruistic or anything, but I don't remember who my first ALRP client was because I was doing the state planning anyway. And so some people I was charging and some people I was not. And um, I would have notes in the file who not to charge, but you know I can't remember as I'm sitting here now who that might be, but I do remember an early case that did stand out to me, it was probably not my first, but somebody came, I don't remember, well, he was referred by ALRP and he came to do his will and his power of attorney and we did all that. And, um, and he didn't, his family was from Bakersfield. He did not want his family involved in anything. And so they weren't. <coughs> and about a year later, I get calls and they said, there, these people are calling me are his friends and they're worried about him because his family came and scooped him up and took him to Bakersfield and weren't letting any of their friends speak to speak to him, any of his friends speak to him. And then somehow I found out that new documents had been drafted in Bakersfield. Mm. So I got a hold of the attorney who did the drafting. And we were having a phone call and I was saying, well, you know, what's going on? You know, he had named his sister, who he apparently didn't like the year before. He had named his sister as his power of attorney, his health care directive. We called them powers of attorney for health care then. 
And um, so I'm starting to have this argument with the attorney in Bakersfield. And we had somebody from Pillsbury Madison involved with the panel at that time. And I thought, I could bring in the guns if I need to. <laughs> and so I threatened that. And, it, and he said to me, the attorney on the phone said to me, what do you people want? At which point I hung up. <laughs> the phone rang two minutes later. He called back. I'm really sorry, how, how can we work this out? And you know, it didn't work out really the way I would have loved, but it worked out that the friends could communicate with the guy. And at this point, I don't know if he's competent or not competent and the friends were satisfied. So I, and I, so I kind of just felt like I'd done what I could do. And, uh, but it was really, I'll never forget him saying that to me. What do you people want? I have one more anecdote uh, about an early an early case um, that uh, that Viv and I handled. So, I mean, the primary focus in the very very beginning was wills and powers of attorney. But as the years and um, the months went on, we started getting other kinds of referrals from ALRP, and this was an employment case of a high manager at one of the car dealerships uh, on Van Ness back then when it was car dealership row back in the mid eighties. And he was the finance manager. Um, and they somehow got wind because he had a doctor's appointment and uh, that he had HIV and had AIDS, uh, but he was still able to work. Uh, and so um, they fired him once they learned about his condition. So we took the case and, uh, li you know, litigated the case with, you know, demand letters. And uh, it was pretty clear cut. The evidence was clear that they fired him just because he had AIDS. He could still do his job. And so, you know, obviously it took a few months to work out a settlement for him back and forth. And we finally got a really good settlement for back then for I think it was like $80,000 for him. Lo and behold, we're, he was but by this time he had gotten sicker and was already in the hospital. By the time we reached the settlement before the release was signed, he died. It's like, oh my God. I mean, we had the papers in our hands for him to have it. And of course we had, you know, we were saying, do we have to tell him? Do we have to tell the other side? You know, oh my God. Yeah, and of course we did. Yeah, I think we did, right? But it was like, we, we talked about it, you know? And of course, you know, we didn't want to. We didn't want to. And, and of course they took it off the table, but you know, we had enough economic damages to get like, 25% of what the real settlement was. So that's the kind of thing that was happening in those days that if you, you couldn't act fast enough and, and people just you know, took advantage of that. Well, thank you to all three of you for sharing the biggest legal needs faced by people living with HIV AIDS when ALRP began. How about some of the challenges in trying to recruit new attorneys to the panel in the early days? Well, at the very first, at the very beginning, people were afraid that they'd catch AIDS. It's like, you know, if I'm in the room, will I catch it? You know, if I, um, that didn't last too very long. That was sort of, um, the, the challenge, well, there were a couple of challenges. One was this question, do you have to be gay to provide legal services to somebody with AIDS. This may seem like a crazy question, but we actually had hours of discussion about this. Um, and, and first of all, let me just also say, many of our panel members, in fact, Janet, who couldn't be here tonight, many of our panel members were lesbian. It was, it was really, at a time, San Francisco had been rather separatist in the, for anybody who's, 
I don't know if anybody's that old in this room, that San Francisco, there was really like, and Carl said, the first lesbian and gay law firm. These were very separatist, um, but there were lots of lesbians involved. But there was a belief that unless you were them, yourself, first of all, in San Francisco, unlike New York, 90 some percent of the clients were gay. There were not a lot of blood transfusion or Haitian or other, other groups. Um, there was a belief that only if you were gay could you understand what people were going through. And also only if you were gay would the client trust you. And at, one, at a certain point, we were overloaded and we didn't have enough lawyers. And also there'd be particular areas. Like it's one thing to do a power of attorney if you're new at it, insurance law, don't, you know, don't ask me to do insurance law. Um, and so we actually were approached by Kenya Neiman and then Janet Selden of the um, San Francisco Bar Association. And they said, we've got these lawyers who are part of the volunteer legal services program. Can we be part of your panel? And we, first of all, we were really needing people and also like, they brought like these people from big law firms who had secretaries and, you know, <laughs> conference rooms and things that most of us didn't have. Um, and we decided we, you didn't need to be gay to do this work. Um, but it was interesting. We had, to, we had these trainings of like how to explain, you know, gender diversity, how to explain, you know, what you what you don't ask people, you know, how do you refer to somebody's partner? We actually did this kind of gay 101 training <laughs> training for people. Um, it was fun. Um, uh, the other thing that we did, um, and I, mean, I had forgotten about mentioning this earlier. So we did incorporate it, and I'll just mention because it comes up in this issue. VLSP had a requirement of indigency. Our approach was, if you're not indigent now, you're going to be indigent soon. So we did not do a means test for helping people. We had to develop two lists of lawyers because the VLSP lawyers could only work with indigent clients. And some of us could work with all clients regardless of that. The other thing we did in order to recruit lawyers who were working for, let's say, government agencies, we got a, 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 an organizational malpractice policy. We, I didn't even know, I didn't even know that existed before. So that if you were working for the government or you're retired where you don't carry malpractice, if you do an ALRP case, you're covered. And, and I wanted to say that was one of the things that as a standalone organization, we can talk about this later, about ALRP as a standalone organization, as opposed to part of Shanti or part of Coming Home or other groups, everybody on our board got it. Like, we need to do this. You can't say to lawyers, oh, these people are never going to sue you. Um, you know, <laughs> and I don't know if there's ever been a single claim on the policy, but our lawyers needed that assurance. So that those are some of the ways we expanded our recruitment 40 years only one <laughs> well and, and let me just say it, which i never reported to the alrp but the one of the two or three and the most recent which is 10 years ago the most recent complaint that was made about me uh on to, to the bar association was from an alrp client <laughs> there was no justification for it i wrote a letter Actually, I had a lawyer sign the letter that I wrote and they wrote back and said, okay, you're, you're, you're fine. So. How did you sustain the organization over time? Sorry. How, do you, how do you sustain it? Better. So let me, let me just quickly say, so after I got involved with that meeting and I became a panel attorney and I had gone to organizations, some with Steve Richter, some by myself, um, I became, you know, on the list and I would take cases. And that's what I did for a number of years. And the organization evolved without me somehow. Um, I also should say that it was during that time that Steve Richter himself died. 
So the person who I think we can thank mostly for getting this organization off the ground never really saw it take off in, e even to the point where it was funded. Yeah, but Fred, why don't you? So, and, get, and the other person to give honor to who is, uh, lives up in Sonoma is Gary Woods who worked for, for Steve. And I don't know if you wanted to count the number of hours and skills and energy and love and affection that he devoted, um, it's unmatched. Um, so let me ask the question this way. So first of all, just to quickly cover this, ALRP was a project of bailiff from 83 to 89, Nine. at which point it became a standalone uh, nonprofit legal referral organization. It's sort of outgrown bailiff and we can talk about that later. I, I would say, first of all, I mean, we had a great team. I mean, you know, Melinda Griffith, Alice Phillipson, Virginia Palmer. We had an amazing team of people, Barry was involved, who were not only really smart, really dedicated, some had secretaries to help, and we didn't have ego. We were like, what's the job? Can you do it? Can you do it? Can you do it? Can you do it? And um, what I found amazing looking back is a couple of key decisions were made. One was to not join a larger AIDS organization. This has been a lot of controversy because like in LA, for example, the Gay Community Center provides 90% of all services under the umbrella, including legal services. At one point, San Francisco had 114 AIDS organizations. Wow. I mean, talk about inefficiency, um, you know, each with their boards, you know, but we figured that we knew, and I used the malpractice example of that, we knew what our lawyers needed and there was pride. I mean, most lawyers marching down the gay parade don't get applauded. Most lawyers don't get applauded much at all, but there was pride in this organization, both from bailiff and ALRP. So we kept a separate organization. The other was until, I don't know, the early 90s, when the work started changing and everything, we were 100% dependent on volunteers, which first of all, solved all of our fundraising problems. You tell a foundation that you're delivering $500,000 of legal services on one and a half full-time equivalents person. You know, we had Rena France and, and, and Clint. So, that decision to rely on um, volunteers and to stay a separate organization, uh, I think those decisions have just served the organization really, really well in a way that kept it sustained. You know, what did you say? You never want to ever be written up in the bar, in the BAR? For a scandal. Right. Right. <laughs> and ALRP never has been. And let me just add one thing. So um, during this period that Fred is talking about, from the meeting in Steve Richter's office to the mid through the late 80s, uh, bailiff continued to operate, I'm sorry, ALRP continued to operate as a committee of bailiff. And so the other thing that I think sustained it was it followed the bailiff model of having a male and female co-chair, which I think was unlike any other organization then or now. And I think is one of the reasons that things were always worked out cooperatively. Nobody was feeling they were being left out. And so in the late eighties, I don't know when, 87 maybe, I was elected to the bailiff board and I was asked to be, my committee on the bailiff board was the ALRP. So I became the, you know, not only a bailiff board member, but the ALRP male co-chair and Alice Phillipson, who uh, Bill mentioned and, and Fred mentioned who died last year was the female co-chair. And I, to my surprise, there was this committee that had been working for three or four years very well um, as a committee of bailiff, but not really. They were kind of operating on their own, doing their thing. 
Um, and so this leads up to the spinoff from Bailiff, which we can get to when you want to get to it. I should but, just note that we still have in our We should note that at that point, there really only were two genders <laughs> and, every, and, and everybody was assigned to one or the other. <laughs> uh, well, Fred, thank you for mentioning uh, Clint Hockenberry, the ALRP's first executive director. Can any of you tell us a little bit about working with him? Well, can I, let me just briefly talk about how he got hired. So um, this is one of these classic rules you never want to make a suggestion in a room of lawyers because what will they say? Do it. Good idea. You do it. Do it. So um, we were at a meeting in the spring of 85 in Melinda Griffith's office. She was at McCutcheon. And um, uh, Steve, I think, had died and Gary was still alive. And Gary was running this single-handedly while he was trying to make a living as a lawyer. And I said, Gary, you can't keep doing this. We need to hire somebody. So I got the job and I had never done fundraising, but again, it was actually easy fundraising. We got a first grant from the San Francisco Foundation and Horizons Foundation. We got money from most of the major law firms. Uh, we got money from uh, Van Loeb & Sells, a couple other foundations. And that enabled us to hire at that point, I think half time, maybe two thirds time, half time, Clint. And maybe you remember how we found Clint, I don't remember, but that enabled us to hire him. We got free office space from the Employment Law Center, through, I should say cubicle space um, <laughs> from the Employment Law Center. And that's how we ended up hiring Clint. And do we know how Clint came to us? I don't know. I don't remember. Yeah, what he was doing before, I don't know. <laughs> oh, oh, I know now. He, he was should, never have been hired. He should. <laughs> no, no, he was a uh, a volunteer lawyer working with the Whitman Walker Clinic in Washington D.C. And his lover, then John Stansel, had gotten the job at Ward Five, and they moved to San Francisco. Right. So he was. Oh, one of the key things is he had a very well paid husband, boyfriend, doctor, doctor <laughs> which enabled him to come work for us for our meager low salary. So, and let me, the question is, what was it like working with Clint? And so when I became, he'd been there for a while as, as the director. And um, when I became ALRP male co-chair via bailiff, he was the director. So theoretically, he was reporting to me. And, 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 you know, and, and we did work out a relationship like that where, you know, important things would happen. He would call me and I would call him and, you know, I have to, people, you know, sometimes have this way of deifying Clint because he was the first director and all that kind of stuff. And that's not wrong really, but basically he was just, you know, he was, he had a job to do and he was good at it. And he was a nuts and bolts kind of person, um, level-headed, easy to work with. I mean, I can't remember him and I ever having a disagreement about anything. We just there was one that he and I had, but I don't remember what it was. <laughs> good, good. Uh, you know, I, I, well, you know, the, the just the, the, if there was a disagreement, it was over spinning the organization off from bailiff and so there was that debate <clears throat> but you know in terms of running the organization things to do i you know i don't he was just a great person to work with yeah i remember clint because uh when we had our law offices at 25 van s he had i think it was called hickory between yeah. oak and van s mm -hmm. a little side office there so we interacted quite a bit and and clint was kind of uh, you know, one of the uh, spokes in the San Francisco model, which was uh, a, a model of dealing with AIDS that the rest of the world followed. 
Um, and I remember, uh, you know, a lot of the lawyers that uh, had volunteered, like like Fred said, you know, they didn't know all these areas of law. A lot, a lot of us didn't, you know. And so Clint um, organized a manual. I don't know if you guys remember that. A, a massive manual of each area of the law of the, the cases that uh, you needed to know and how to basically step by step, whether it was landlord tenant or wills or employment or insurance. And it was a major, major job to put all that together in three ring binders and get it out to people and uh, other people, uh, other organizations all, all over the country. Uh, followed uh, in, in those in those original footsteps. Well, actually, one of the things that Clint also had, having worked with Whitman Walker in Washington, apropos of what you were just saying, he had a sense of the larger importance of what we were doing. And actually, he took on this project of organizing, actually, I can say the world's first conference on legal issues of people with AIDS. It was in 1988. It was at the Green Room in San Francisco mm -hmm. in above Herbst um, Hall. And it was, a, I think, maybe two days, maybe one day. And people came from all over the country and including, and in addition to talking about the legal issues of landlord-tenant, insurance, et cetera, we also had a whole sessions about how do you organize a panel like this, asking all these questions about, do you have malpractice? Who the lawyers have to be? And people from volunteer legal service programs and gay and AIDS organizations from all over the country came. There may have been 200 people. And it was a sense of, of Clint's sense of, I'm going to do something important. And it's not just about these individual clients. Thank you. Um, so we have lost many members to AIDS. Can you share some of your memories of those folks? Mm, yeah. The hard part, you know, I mean, especially in the early years. So, so many uh, people died. I mentioned uh, Tom Steele, um, who was, you know, a very important um, out gay lawyer. Um, and, uh, but in the beginning, um, a lot of people on the bailiff board just didn't make it. Um, I mean, we had uh, Larry Long, who was the uh, chief counsel of the Bar Association of San Francisco. He was uh, one of the early, a leather man, uh, one of the early, early people uh, to die, to die from AIDS. Uh, uh, Steve Block was a, an early co-chair and he was a partner in a big downtown Heller. Firm. Yeah, Heller, big partner in Heller. And then, and then he 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 moved to, to be a law professor at the University of Minnesota. And um, he also testified at the uh, Clarence Thomas hearings in support of Anita Hill. Um, no, that, was, that was Joe Apol. Yes, that was Joe, Joe Apol. Sorry, I got those mixed up. That's uh, who also died. No, he's yeah, around. Joe's around. Okay. Around well, around. Well, well, Steve. Yeah. So uh, Steve uh, uh, eventually um, also he died a, as a law professor in uh, in Minnesota. Uh, there there were so many people. I, I was trying to think of it the other day, you know. And uh, to be honest, uh, in in thinking about coming here and, and preparing, it brought back some of the trauma. You know, it's like oh my, you know. Uh, of, of living uh, at that time, you know, because none of us knew who was going to be next. Well, and, and let me just say something about Steve. He, even after he moved to Minnesota, he and I remained pretty good friends. And we would talk on the television. In fact, Dynasty was a big TV show at the time. You <laughs> You're right, age, you're dating yourself. <laughs> and he would have the nerve to call me after watching it central time and saying, you want to hear what happens on Dynasty tonight? <laughs> and again, I would say, I'm going to hang up. Um, but, you know, Steve was also the uh, chair of the ACLU Gay Rights Committee, 
back in the early 80s and did the, some early litigation, the Pacific Telephone case, stuff like that. Um, he got sick and died within two weeks. Um, you know, by the time I heard that he was sick and in the hospital, he, he, you couldn't even talk to him. So, and that was a very big loss. And of course, Steve Richter and, you know, many, many, many people. All right. I think about Jay Spears also. And Jay, Jay was uh, a, a, C, a, a top partner at um, uh, um, Nemirovsky. Yeah, Howard Rice. Howard Rice. Uh, and uh, he was uh, really uh, quite a lawyer and um, a part, part, if, partner of uh, Terry Stewart. If Bailiff were a synagogue, we would have a whole wall full of plaques and lights of names from Bailiff. I, I actually was, I'm, I'm preparing to retire, so I was cleaning out parts of my office and um, I actually came across, in addition to two annual reports I gave you, the 1988 Bailiff membership list which was confidential at the time, but I was on the board. So I had the list and I actually haven't gone through it mm -hmm. to see, you know, how, what, how many people died. The, the person I was just so fond of, and in fact, it ties into one of my cases. Um, I worked with Paul Thurston. I don't know if any of you knew Paul mm -hmm. um, on defending, representing a guy who had been evicted and his landlord said, actually, you know, I don't want anybody with AIDS living in my apartment. And unlike your case, frankly, he did survive through a jury trial. And we won a verdict of $150,000, which was a lot of money, both at that time and to him. Um, uh, and, uh, and he was able to use that to pay his housing the rest of his life. And Paul and I worked on that case. I was the real estate lawyer. Paul had been his ALRP client. Oh, the other requirement is if you ever made money in a case, you had to turn, what was it? 15%? 10%, 15%? in. 10%. 10%. Always welcome to donate more of the fee back to it. Um, and he, Paul was just starting to get sick during the trial. And then fortunately did live long enough for just to have our client get his money and, and get housing. But um, yeah, it was, it was part of the job. It was really hard. Well, thank you for sharing all the history. Uh, moving on to the present, what do you see as, as the greatest legal issues facing people living with HIV needs now? No. Well, I mean, number one, it's amazing to me that uh, from uh, those days that we're talking about of an all volunteer lawyers, you know, and except for, you know, for Clint when he was hired. Uh, and now there are what, 16 uh, lawyers on the staff and parallel 12, 12, 12 attorneys on the staff. Yeah, 12 full time attorneys on the staff and paralegals and social workers and 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 that. It, to me is uh, uh, amazing of, of how that has, uh, the organization has, has grown into really a, a law firm. Of Although we always thought that the real success of ALRP is that it would be out of business in 15 years, not either because there would be a cure, right? but even if there were, there wouldn't be any legal problems anymore. So, um, <laughs> You're looking like, how dumb were we, right? <laughs> but we just thought, you know, after we win these victories, you know, nobody would be evicted. No family would mistreat somebody. We, we had that kind of optimism that, you know, we didn't need to plan our 40th anniversary event because we would be happily out of business. Right. So as, as I sit here today, I am not surprised that the ALRP is still here. But if I take myself back to myself in 1983, shocked, totally shocked. This is impossible. Yeah. Yeah. I knew here we are, uh, you know, 40 years on, and there's still no vaccine for HIV. I mean, you know, uh, uh, COVID, we had a vaccine in 11 months. But uh, I, I looked at some statistics today 
that um, now uh, there are between 1.4 and 2.3 million new AIDS infections, HIV infections worldwide every year. 1.4 to 2.3 million new infections and more than 32 million people have died of AIDS since the beginning of the epidemic. So I want to toss the question back to Cassandra and Sean, because you're, you know, the ones who are active. What are the biggest legal challenges that are, that you are facing as either as a, as a volunteer or knowing about people with AIDS? What are the biggest areas of challenge? Today. Yeah. yeah. You folks know, and Bill, you folks know more than we do. So and tell us. Because of COVID, there's been a lot of housing issues um, and then just immigration as well. Um, Bill could correct me if I'm wrong. Um, the, the biggest legal issue by far for our clients is around housing. Um, we handled about 2,300 cases last year and about 870 were housing cases. Um, every kind of housing case from eviction to uh, fair housing, habitability, unlawful rent increases. Um, we ha handled close to 200 immigration cases um, and we can, a, a significant number of those are around political asylum, uh, adjustment of status, naturalization, uh, and then the, the next biggest area of law, I would say, is around benefits. We have our insurance attorney here. Um, we take a pretty wide view of benefits. So it's government entitlements as well as private long-term disability insurance policies. The, those are the biggest legal challenges that our clients face. But we still get um, requests for help with employment, uh, certainly still with uh, estate planning, that's still a significant part of our practice. You know, one of the things that that I wanted to bring out, which um, is a highlight of what you're just saying, in the beginning, the idea was we were only helping people who had legal problems tied to their HIV status. Fired from a job, as Carl said, kicked out of your apartment, as I said, alienated from your family where the AIDS condition was the central cause of the legal problem. At some point, and this was actually openly discussed, we started to say, and I, and, and I don't remember whether this is one of the arguments with Clint or not, because I think Clint was a big advocate for saying, if these people have AIDS, we're gonna help them, even if it's at a landlord tenant case because they didn't pay their rent, even if it's a, uh, conflict with their sister because of a family conflict. We're going to help them because they have AIDS, not because it's an AIDS related legal problem. And there was actually a lot of tension about this because it's like, so if I'm dying of breast cancer, I can't get a free lawyer, but I have AIDS. I do. There was this kind of problem in San Francisco where ironically people with AIDS actually got better services than people of uh, dying of other diseases because of all this outpouring. And our attitude was, we've got the volunteer lawyers. These people have special needs. We're going to help them. So I would ask the question back to Sean and Cassandra and, and Bill, of all of the work that the panel does now, is it mostly people who need legal help, need legal help because they have AIDS or people who have, need legal help because of an AIDS-related legal dispute. Um, so it, it is an important point. Um, and our belief is still strongly that um, any legal challenge will result in uh, the deterioration of somebody's health. And our, our mission is really to address the health needs of people living with HIV by addressing their legal issues. So um, you, you can be facing an eviction and you're still going to have your health impacted if you, are, uh, if you lose your housing, whether the issue is related to HIV or not. Thanks for the technical assistance. <laughs> so, so can I suggest that, because I, I, I think we don't want to like jump too much into the present without on page three, the first question, I think this would be a good time 
to talk about that. Hey, um, so can you tell us um, why you decided to form your own organization rather than being part of a larger program? So actually, I think, Fred, you can talk yeah. about the reasons why, and then I can talk about the reasons why not. Well, I, I, I touched on this earlier, and um, <clears throat> let me say that because we, and this ties into our being a bailiff panel, guess what we all were? We were all lawyers. So I, I think that a lot of the thinking about this, as opposed to, for example, in New York, where the legal services are often provided by the gay men's health crisis in LA, where it's the LA Community Center, we really had this kind of parental notion of we need to take care of our lawyers and our staff. And we don't want to let some non lawyer, you know, be Clint's boss. I mean, we were like, we, we, we know best. And all of these things we've talked about who do you help? Do you require indigency? We just felt that we would get it better. The second is we felt that we would have trouble recruiting lawyers or they would have trouble recruiting lawyers if we were part of the Shanti Project or the AIDS Foundation. They wouldn't get it. They wouldn't, like, like, like again, the malpractice, the training, the book that Clint did. Um, or even, for example, I, one of the hardest things I had to convince funders were, why do you need a high paid lawyer to provide a referral. You know, can't some secretary do that? And it's like many of our clients don't even know what their legal problem is. And knowing what volunteers would be right for them, this is not something that somebody straight out of high school can do. And so this idea that you needed somebody of Clint's capacity and then Bill and other people to manage a referral process was something I felt like we could defend that. We could explain, you know, first of all, you don't want to give somebody the wrong lawyer because then they're going to get disappointed. They're going to get discouraged. Then they're going to get angry. Um, and that we knew best. So it was, we knew best and it was the pride. And this is where even breaking away from Bailiff, Bailiff didn't want to let us go because they wanted the pride of it. And we just felt that if we were just part of some large organization, um, and you know what, I'm sure it works in LA and I'm sure it works in New York, but we felt being on our own worked. The other piece of it was that because our lawyer board, I mean, I was putting in as much as like 20 hours a week, some weeks, everybody else was, Kathleen was our treasurer, Mark was the treasurer for a while. Or we, we, the amount of donated labor, of the board, meant that we weren't one of these inefficient AIDS organizations that had all these staff people. And we believed and obviously convinced people that all that volunteer work from the board meant that we weren't duplicating effort. So when Fred talks about the board, he's really talking about the board after the LRP was formed because there was no board. ALRP was a committee of bailiff. And that presented its own problems because a committee can't fundraise, a committee can't do a lot of things. And <laughs> as you know, and so, um, so, so ALRP and bailiff had to ask various other organizations to be the fiscal sponsor there were all kinds of um, legal, you know, shenanigans, you could say. They weren't shenanigans, it's done legitimately, but there were all kinds of things where we didn't actually control our own money. So there was, a, especially the people who were on the committee wanted to be independent. And so I was the guy kind of in the hot seat because I was the bailiff board member, ALRP male co-chair. So technically I was on the board of both organizations and bailiff rightfully was very proud of the fact that it gave birth to the ALRP. It was on all the bailiff publicity that the ALRP was a bailiff committee and very successful and bailiff didn't really want to let it go. 
and I didn't want to let it go. I thought it should, it's, it's a bailiff committee and that's where it belongs. And um, the bailiff board, you know, talked about it and, 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 and there was tension between the board and the committee. And Clint, I think, wanted to be independent. And um, so finally, Liz Hendrickson, who was the female co-chair of bailiff at the time, after we had talked about this a whole bunch, and she totally agreed with me, came to my office one day and said, Mark, you know, I've been thinking. And we had a nice long conversation in my office about really, what are we doing here? And she convinced me that it was the best thing to do to have ALRP spin off. And the two of us went back to the next bailiff board meeting. I don't remember exactly what happened. We, we pitched it, they said, okay. And at that point, um, Clint took it upon himself to start writing the bylaws, to prepare the application for the um, charitable exemption with the IRS. And he brought it all back to me to have me look at it and as if I knew anything, but you know, make sure the I's were dotted and T's were crossed, I guess. And that's my recollection of how ALRP got spun off. And I have to add that there was an agreement with both bailiff and the uh, San Francisco Bar Association and ALRP, I don't know if ALRP still keeps the agreement. I think it does to a point that ALRP would always say, you know, something like birth by bailiff and, and um, the Bar Association or, you know, co-sponsored by bailiff and the Bar Association, some language that still gives some credit to those organizations for having spawned the organization. And also, I believe a certain number of board seats, at least at the beginning, were going to be presented by bailiff so that there'd always be sort of some people from bailiff looking over to make sure that that origin story was, mo was monitored. And, and the Bar Association. Yeah. yeah. What about the key decision of relying on volunteer lawyers rather than hiring lawyers? How did that come about? Well, the caseloads increased tremendously over the years. And so um, we had a whole bunch of uh, volunteer lawyers, even in the very, very beginning. But, um, well, no, let me back up a second. Because that had been how we had worked for all those years, we were relying on volunteer lawyers and it worked so well. And it was uh, certainly not as expensive as having a full-time staff. Um, and so uh, I think that was the underlying reason that we continued saying that since this worked, and uh, then we, had, we already had uh, hundreds of, of lawyers on, on the volunteer uh, lists be between the bailiff members and the bar association. And so uh, that was the initial decision. I think it was uh, both this was working and financially as a new organization to not get so uh, you know, in, in, in debt necessarily or have to have that much more fundraising that we would continue it as it was in the beginning. And just very quickly, if I could add, I think, again, it was a matter of pride. We were taking care of our people and we were doing it as volunteers. And, the, you know, as a panel attorney, I can only speak for myself, but I think it's true of everybody. We were happy, if that's the word, to do it and, and accomplish something for clients. The other piece of it is... One of the ways each of us, and Bill, you can talk about how you and your staff deal with it. AIDS wasn't my entire caseload. And I could handle one or two at a time. I don't know. I mean, especially in those days, if, it, if I was doing this full time, you know, I'd be, I don't know. Right now. 
Ivy in Palm Springs, <laughs> you know, a swimming pool within a year or two. Um, um, it worked. And what was interesting is if I'm trying to remember, see if I need to remember, what was the first area of law where we hired somebody? I think it was insurance. Because as I recall, first of all, most of the volunteer work we did, you were sort of in and out in a month or two. You do a will, you get somebody a lease. You do, you know, they weren't prolonged representations unless there were these litigations. And you didn't need a lot of technical skills for that. And I think when it started to come to people being denied insurance, people being denied care, people being thrown off their health policy, there was a sense, first of all, that's work that like extends over a year or two sometimes. And you really need to know your law. And to train, you know, corporate lawyers at Morrison and Forrester on how to do AIDS related insurance, it just wasn't efficient. So my memory is that was the first legal hire was somebody around insurance coverage, because that one, that was where we learned that the referral model didn't work for that area of law. And so, Bill, let me ask you, what were the early areas where you felt the referral model didn't, wasn't sufficient? So it's a... a attorneys uh, to uh, shifting to providing more direct representation by staff. And the, the biggest area was housing. Uh, ho housing cases moved through the court system rapidly. Um, there were just too many of them coming in for us to rely on volunteers to handle all of them. So that's when we started to dedicate more uh, staff to providing extensive direct representation. And that area of practice ha has grown because uh, there's we all know that we have an affordable housing crisis in San Francisco. If you lose your housing, there's really no way to get back into housing. So we fight really zealously to keep people living with HIV housed. To cover the other two issues. Okay. Yeah. So since you... So what, why don't we do... Uh, Um, can you tell us how your work at ALRP impacted you both personally and professionally? Oh, that's a big question. <laughs> uh, I mean, one sentence. One sentence, geez. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing too deep. Yeah, I mean, personally, um, it was, I mean, for me, I, uh, I got uh, diagnosed with HIV in 1988 and knew I was infected in 1980 after I found out, you know, that I was positive and I, I knew how. Um, it, uh, it had a special meaning for me to help people. Uh, and um, it also uh, was uh, fearful. Too, you know, because until protease inhibitors got uh, invented and, and released in 1996, March of 96 is when they really started get, getting into the market, everybody was dying, you know, and so, and, and by then, you know, uh, I, uh, you know, I had known for quite a few years and my health was uh, deteriorating, even though I, I, practiced full-time, but doing this work for people, you know, who it was like uh, one of the things that we would say it would be, you know, uh, the, the sick taking care of the sicker and the sicker taking care of the sickest. And, uh, and, and that's, that's what it was in those first 12 years uh, or 13 years. Um, so it was rewarding. Um, but also scary, 
Um, and and uh, professionally, it was uh, it was extremely rewarding. You know, to to know, like like Fred said of, of his example, when all the siblings came after the paperwork was done, you you gave people peace of mind. You know, in 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 the hardest time of their lives, when they knew that they were were dying, and whatever it would be of finishing up business and uh, getting a will in place or trying to get justice because you were mistreated because you. you or sick, um, that was uh, just filled filled me with um, you know a, a lot of uh, of I don't want to say joy, but it was just uh, very fulfilling, you know. So that was the the personal and the professional. It it, it, it mixed so much, you know, because it was our family, our community, our our brothers, you know. Um, so. It, it, it was uh, yeah, hard to separate the uh, professional and the personal in those days. Yeah, for me, I mean, for me, it was, it was therapeutic. I was doing something productive, you know. Um, I couldn't save these guys' life, but I could make their last year better. And... Um, I mean, I, I've had some rewarding work as, in my day job as a lawyer, but I would say, if, you, if I look back and say, where were the moments where I felt, God, I'm glad I got this skill. It was in helping these clients. It was like, this is why I went to law school. I didn't know that this is why I went to law school, but this is what it was. And then the other, you said you weren't going to get heavy. I'm going to get heavy. Um, being in the proximity of death is an important lesson that we all need to learn. And I had a very close cousin who died of AIDS in 1991. And I spent a lot of time talking with his mother and father, who were these incredible P flag. You know, my aunt was so upset that people were hiding that their kids had AIDS. And they were very prominent in the community. She stood at the door of her son's funeral with a basket of red ribbons and personally put one on every person who came to that funeral. Said nobody would ever be ashamed. And at some point she said to me, God, how do you know so much about like death and dying and legal issues? And I said, well, because I've had this like 10 year course through the AIDS legal referral panel. And I just feel like, I learned so much about people and their families and healthcare systems and all of that. It's been an incredible gift to me. And so Fred, first I want to say, I don't think anyone knows why they went to law school. <laughs> <laughs> For me, you know, I mean, I was doing estate planning. I had clients, private clients, non ALRP clients who were dying of HIV. Um, but as an attorney, as a liberal attorney, I, of course, thought it's important to do pro bono work. And I was able to do pro bono work through the ALRP, helping people in my own community. So while the work was hard at times, um, you know, I think one of the things that I would bring to the table most often for people who are clearly dying was to be kind of non-emotional about it and just, you know, treat them as, you know, some young couple coming in to do a trust for their children. Okay, you got to do a will. Let's get it done. Let's do it. Let's talk about what you need. And so, um, and I felt like I was part of something bigger than myself. And I was. Well, and the last question for me is, what do you see as the most likely changes for ALRP in the next five to 10 years? I'm leaving that to you. Yeah, yeah. Or, or to Bill. Uh, I, I think that uh, the legal needs of our clients continue to change. Uh, our clients are uh, living longer. Uh, in San Francisco, 74% of people living with HIV are over the age of 50. 
Um, many of our clients have been living with HIV for decades now. Uh, they have uh, some significant comorbidities. Um, the body has uh, experienced inflammation for years. So your body is stress stressed and there are a significant number of health complications that result. Um, so I, I see the need for legal services for people living with HIV continuing uh, to be uh, very real in San Francisco. Um, and I, I hope that uh, in 10 years, there won't be a need for ALRP services. Um, I would still love to see our organization get to a point where we can say, job well done. Uh, the community, uh, you're, you're better off as a result of these wonderful volunteers and these dedicated staff, and now find another way for you to give back to the community because <laughs> we're no longer needed in this role. Mm -hmm. of time um <laughs> down in front <laughs> jesus uh yeah uh, uh, my name is jesus guillen and uh, besides being your greeter uh, to be here. Um, so but the, the first question is that, you know, did you ever, any of you guys work in, in, in any case that had to do with that particular, uh, you know, thing about uh, that not being able to immigrate because maybe I just don't want to feel alone. Uh, and second, sadly, uh, the, the, the laws that just passed in Uganda are some of the worst laws that we ever heard against LGBTQ people and people with HIV. You, you find someone having gay sex, you have life imprisonment, and if one of the persons is HIV positive, it's a death penalty. How can we prepare ourselves? Because even here in Florida, we are having an anti, whole huge wave of anti-gay and HIV positive things. Uh I, I can try and answer that a, a little bit. Um, since we're, we're talking historically, uh, there, there was a special program that the, the Bar Association of San Francisco led providing legal services to immigrants living with HIV. Um, Janet Selden was going to be on the panel and she was uh, a, a staffer for that program when it was with the Bar Association and she served on ALRP's board for many years. Um, eventually, um, when there was government funding uh, for legal services for people living with HIV, ALRP took over that program from the Bar Association and we started uh, providing services for immigrants living with HIV, and we've seen significant shifts around the law in immigration. It used to be that you were excludable if you were LGBT. Uh, you were not able to enter the country if you had HIV. Now we can secure political asylum for someone based on being a member of the LGBT community. We can secure asylum for someone based on their HIV status. And you are absolutely correct about the horrible laws that we see um, in many places in Africa. ALRP provides legal services to immigrants. We've secured political asylum for folks coming from countries in Africa where depending on where you live, you are either uh, at risk of being in prison for life or uh, put to death. So the, there is still a great need for uh, legal services for immigrants. There is, uh, has not been any consensus at the federal level around uh, reform of immigration law. So there are very few options for folks who uh, have been here for a long time and don't have legal status. There aren't great, uh, magic things that we can do to, to make the law better. Um, it, it is going to require a consensus at the federal level that we haven't seen in a long time. Uh, 
Thank you. Um, What's up? It's me. <laughs> thank you all for being here. And thank you for sharing all these stories. It's actually really amazing to hear. Um, so uh, I guess I wanted to ask, um, so I heard liberal lawyers, you know, and, and uh, the feeling of doing something. Did you at that time, did you consider yourself activists? Did you, um, did you interact with some of the other AIDS organizations or uh, kind of grassroots organizations, ACT UP, any of the national organizations that were around? Can you talk a little bit about some of the, um, I don't know, less frontline stuff that was going on, policy stuff that was happening and your interactions with those, those folks? Well, the best example, and it really ties to bailiff as much, was the bathhouse controversy. 1985, um, Mayor Art Agnos, I think, and Mel, Mel so Feinstein. No, I think Feinstein was gone in 85. She was already in the Senate then, or out. She was not. But, okay, maybe it was Feinstein. So, and, and Mervyn Silverman, the aides are, wanted to close the bathhouses, saying that there was too much AIDS transmission. And none of the AIDS organizations would go public about saying people should have the right to have sex with strangers. It was like, you know, it didn't fit the model of a good gay person doesn't do this. And Bailiff took that on. And Bailiff was the plaintiff in the lawsuit against the city that ended up in this very convoluted settlement about doors being open and, and condoms being distributed. But there was an example where the bailiff lawyers actually were in the front line of advocacy around and activism in that, in, in that particular fight. And ultimately the bathhouses were closed. Yes. They were. I should also note that um, it was a political act for people just to be out. in terms of acceptance over the, the last four years. And in addition to the 300 people, the bailiff dinner, part of that, they, those were judges from all over the Bay Area. Um, so just forming bailiff was a political act and just being part of that was a political act. But I think the three of us would say for the most part, the ALRP, our job was not to be a political act. Our job was to provide services for people who needed them. And, and all of us, I, I know on our own, not necessarily uh, by, by the organization, we were, I consider myself an activist at the time, but it wasn't, you know, my role in, at ALRP it was just, there was so much going on that, that needed, you know, us to, to fight and be in the streets. Uh, both just for gay rights and for, uh, you know, HIV back then, where, you know, we had the president of the United States didn't say the word for eight years, you know. Uh, so it was, uh, you know, individually, I think uh, all of us uh, were taking part of that, of marches on Washington and, and things of, of that nature. I have to say, on behalf of the late Alice Philipson, who was an incredible activist, yeah. she would say we were kind of wimpy <laughs> and that, you know, she would file lawsuits that we were all like, oh, my God, this is going to, you know, you know, this is really crazy. Or she would encourage people to go to demonstrations. I think we felt proud of what we were doing and individually people could do things. But we actually were very conscious of saying we're actually not an activist organization. We're serving the people with AIDS. We will sue over these various things. Um, um, but, 
you know, I don't know how many of our panel lawyers uh, got arrested in the 1987 March on Washington when there was a protest about the sodomy decision. Um, I don't know how many of our lawyers would like go to jail for locking themselves, you know, to the fence of the Supreme Court. We weren't a real activist kind of group, I would say. Except I was at the 1987 March. I did not get arrested. <laughs> But, you know, the story I told earlier about the attorney in Bakersfield, I think we made a difference. Yeah. I mean, just hanging up, right, made a difference. So we'll, we have time for one more question from the, the audience. If not. Cool. Yeah. Well, thank you all for coming this evening. I want to, again, thank our colleagues at MOFO who have generously hosted this evening. I want to thank our moderators and our esteemed panelists. Everybody should give them a hand. Yeah. A rich experience for me to know that there are folks uh, like our wonderful panelists who are still showing up for ALRP, still there for our clients 40 years in. Uh, I think for an organization like ALRP to be uh, thriving 40 years uh, since its inception is pretty remarkable. Um, on that note, uh, there are opportunities for you to support ALRP. This is our 40th anniversary year. We have a significant fundraising goal to ensure that our services are available for folks who need them. We have a Legal Eagles AIDS Walk team. I encourage folks to join the Illegal Eagles and help us raise money. It's a very quick and easy thing to do. Um, and we have some QR codes up here if folks are interested in making a, an easy online donation. Do not ask me for the tech support to do that, but I do have the codes up here. Um, and with that, thanks everybody. There's, there's still some more food. There's still some wine. Feel free to hang out before uh, the, the folks kick us out. <laughs>